It's really great to be here at such an exciting event and at such an exciting place too and such extraordinary beauty. You know, I often say this, either we take hold of our future or the future takes hold of us. I started as a physician before I started consulting to big companies about the future. My specialty was cancer, looking after people dying of cancer and helping them to live out their last days at home. For me, it was an extraordinarily fulfilling experience. And through the AIDS Foundation, I am still connected with this kind of work. And I learned one very important truth. Life is short. And as I've set this presentation to make us think in the year 2015, looking forward to 2020, I hope you will allow me a little bit of inner town fun uh, to speculate a little bit about what may have happened looking back to 2010 and looking forward from 2015 to 2020. So don't take the presentation too seriously, okay? It's designed to make us think. And by the way, it's a technique you can use. One of the most powerful ways for me to understand your vision of your business is to ask you to write your own annual report for 2017. What did it show in your company? Who did you buy? What did you sell? It helps you. It's a visionary technique. So that's what we're going to do with our whole world. But before we go there, I've learned one truth. And the truth was true 3,000 years ago. And it will be true in 25,000 years' time. And that life is short. And life is too short to do things you don't believe in. Put your hands up if you think that's true. Life is too short to do things you don't believe in. Put your hands up if you think that's true. Life is too short to sell things you know are crap. Correct? Put your hands up if you think that's true. <laughs> life's too short to sell a promise you can't fulfill. Isn't that correct? Why? Life's too short. Okay, because we have choices. Because there are things we can do that actually are worthwhile. And that's what makes my passion. And that's what makes your purpose. And when we connect with passion and purpose, we find leadership and vision and the rest. Now, let's take a little bit of a review of our journey and just look what happened in the last few weeks. We've seen an artificial kidney grown. We've seen an oil price in excess of $200 because of other factors we'll see just now. We've seen a woolly, a woolly mammal actually reproduced from some of its own genetic code. We've seen a China real estate crash just in the last few weeks. And we've seen the first... Uh, the first use of a human eye as a camera, we'll come to some of that technology in a moment. All kinds of things are changing in our world very fast. At the same time, we understand this. One of the greatest risks in 2015 in your business is institutional blindness. It's when we spend too much time with people who have the same worldview. You may have the same pair of glasses because you are born in the same country. It may be that you are also a banker and you work with bankers. You're a pharmaceutical uh, a research and development person and you work with other pharma people. But one of the greatest risks, as I say, is institutional blindness. And one of the purposes of coming all the way here uh, to fly, to, to walk, to travel, to, to engage away from the rest of the business is to give us space to take off our glasses and to put on other people's glasses. To put on other glasses within this community and within our world. To see the world in a different place. Because life will not be the same. And more of the same will not do the, do, do the job. We need to think differently if we're going to be successful in the future. Now, I spend most of my time on the outer edge of this radar screen. Because on the outer edge is all innovation, all new trends, and all the, uh, the uncertainties in our world. But at the center is usually business strategy. That's where boards spend most of their time thinking. Um, and, uh, and yet, all the real business of the future is on the outer edge. So let's take a journey and look at the outer edge. And one thing we noticed straight away from the last five years, if we learned one thing from 2.10 to 2.15, it's this. All trends are related. In our world, there's no such thing as an isolated incident. And the smallest thing that happens in Syria connects with something else that's happening in Iran, connects with something that's happening in China, connects with something that happens on Facebook or on Google. And there's one word which will drive the future more than any other. You might like to think about what you think that word is. I will reveal it in a few minutes. One single word will drive the future more than economics, more than technology, more than innovation, more than politics. One single word, and it's not leadership. See, stuff happens. Stuff happens in our world. All kinds of events take place. 
And uh, that's why we have to, in our increasingly accelerating environment, we have to understand that we need more than one strategy if we're going to succeed. Because the world changes faster than you can have a board meeting. In the last 24 hours, we've seen the first strikes by the United States military against Iran. We've seen that in partnership with Israel, who went in, as we know, three weeks ago. We don't know the future of that, but already we've seen a further oil price spike of $20 and we've seen all kinds of stresses and strains in the market. And if you've been watching your, if you've been looking at your own smartphones at the markets in the last few hours, you'll have seen 10 to 15% wiped off all share prices across Europe, in Asia, and in America, just in the last hour and a half. We're in difficult and strange times. We're in a world where as the world changes faster than you can call a board meeting, it requires us to have agile leadership, to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. Yes, you have a main strategy built on your core competence, built on the strength of your products, the understanding of your customers. But we also have a plan B. We understand what will happen if, let's say, Spain follows Greece out of the Eurozone and so on. We have more than one plan. And we consider the future. Bearing in mind Obama has been under pressure, we don't know, who know whether he will win a, a third uh, well, he can't win a third, but we don't know what will happen the, as a result of the next American election. He's done, he did very well, he got a landslide last time, which gave him some of the might and the muscle which he's needed to transform a lot of America's political situation, including the health spending. But we need agile leadership. Agile leadership, what does that mean within the European Union? I wish we had agile leadership in the EU. We still have some of the same problems and challenges we've had for the last five years. We still have at the center of the European Union, of course, these two super states, France and Germany, still in debate. And the personalities changed, but the politics have not. These two countries are locked in tension and in union for political reasons. If we want to understand the future, you have to understand history. The European Union was created out of the ashes of the Second World War. It was created because there was less than 20 years between the la last bullet of the First World War and the beginnings of more war in the Second World War. And in that, the European Union project was very successful for 60 years in helping to guarantee peace, welding big countries together, two big countries in particular being France and Germany. You want to understand the future? Look at the past. Actually, if you're Greek, you look a long way back in the past. I was back in, uh, in Athens just the other day. I said, uh, well, what was it like to be thrown out of the Eurozone in 2013? They said, we weren't thrown, we walked. Okay, well, there we are. But nevertheless, and of course, they have done, uh, through, seen extraordinary things. The drachma fell by, by 45% within one day, then recovered 10, 15%, then dived another 25%. We know what happened since, and since that time, in the last 12 months, we've seen Greece on the rebound, just like Turkey did after a massive devaluation in, in, uh, in the early 2000s, just like, uh, uh, just like uh, we saw in Thailand, just like any other emerging economy that frees its currency to float. We saw a collapsing currency, which meant that exports started to drive out, imports became more expensive, uh, that, uh, that uh, oh, there was a boom in that country, and that's exactly what's happening in Greece, of course. And now we have a, a small stampede of some other countries that are quite thinking about doing the same thing. But Greece has a perspective on the future which comes from the past. You see, I sit, sat in the cafe just last week. I said, uh, tell me about the Grexit. And he said, ha! He said, what a lot of fuss about nothing. He said, look behind you, what do you see? I say, uh, I see the Parthenon. He said, yes, of course, and it's still being reconstructed. And it will be reconstructed or deconstructed or rebuilt or debuilt for the next 3,000 years, just like it has been for the last 3,000 years. And tell me, he said, how, how long is the Euro project? He said, how long do you think it will survive? He said, the Roman Empire survived several hundred years. Our own Greek Empire, several hundred years. The, uh, the Ottoman Empire, a thousand years. And the European project, a little blip on the, on, the, on the spasms of human history, gone in a moment. And Greece, we look at the Parthenon, we will continue, the Euro may not. Actually, we need a sense of history to understand that with these convulsions, things come, they go, 
The world does not come to an end. Businesses still continue. People continue to fall in love. They get married. They have families. They, uh, teenagers grow up and they look in the mirror and still wonder if anyone will love them when they grow older. We learn from history that passions, human passions, remain roughly the same over three or four or five thousand years and will continue for another ten thousand years, perhaps, so long as there are human beings. And yet our history can haunt us. History, recent history, history in the last hundred years shapes our future, our future. So it was the history of hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic back in 1922-23 that continued to make it so difficult for Germany to agree to print money for very understandable reasons. And of course it was only as a result of the Brexit that we had finally uh, the, 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 the really aggressive action that we needed to shore up the European Union's banking system with to date 2 trillion euros of additional currency being injected into the system. Yes, good old fashioned printing of money. And why was that so sensitive? Because, of course, every family in Germany remembers. Every family in Germany remembers somewhere in their history a grandfather or a great-grandfather taking a wheelbarrow of cash to buy a loaf of bread. And by the time he got there, the cash was not enough. And he came home with half a loaf. And more recently, we've seen the same thing in Zimbabwe. I have in my pocket a $10 trillion bill that was printed in 2010 uh, 2009, I'm sorry, uh, by a government that decided to pay for everything by printing money. So printing money we know is a toxic thing to do in an uncontrolled environment and nevertheless the European Union has been forced to do it and we now have inflation running at 6, 6.5%. We'll be tipping over to 7% this year partly because of the Iran strike pushing up the oil prices which I'll come to in a moment. The future of Europe. Well, we know the future of your business, of course, rests on your vision, it rests on your strategy, but if there is no clear vision and no clear strategy, uh, then how can you provide leadership? And I want to ask you a question of you here today. Who of you, put your hands up if you could name for me, uh, imagine where you were five years ago. <laughs> where were you? Five years ago, May uh, 2012. Uh, in 2010, could you have named me the, Europe, the president of the European Union or the leader of the European Union? Put your hands up if you could name an individual who was the leader of the European Union in that year. Put your hands up if you could name the leader or the president of the European Union or the European Council of any kind of European thing. I don't really mind what it is. But if you could name an individual who is supposedly providing European leadership, is not doing it on behalf of a national government. He's actually saying, I have the European Union's well-being in my heart. More than being Swiss, more than Norwegian, more than British. Just, I am a Euro person. I'm a Eurozone person. I'm providing leadership. In 2012, May 2012, put your hands up if you could have named such an individual. One. Now we understand the problem of the Euro and the European Union. Because we have a cluster of people who are fighting it out with words and uh, all kinds of economic theories, who seem to agree on nothing except one thing, which is the protection of their own national interest. And that, as I say, is a very dangerous situation. Now, if we look at China, 2015, where are we now? Well, we've seen a lot happen in China in the last five years, and China has its own emotional history, which, of course, is related to one word. For Germany, it was the printing of money, which led to catastrophic results. For China, it's revolution, which also led to catastrophe. And the, uh, the images of Chairman Mao are still recent in many families. And that is why the Chinese government has been so insistent on provoking economic growth beyond anything that we could imagine. Every year, 8, 9, 10%, if possible, um, and almost a big disaster is for China to drop its economic growth to 5%, 4%, and actually it dropped to 3% in 2013, as we know and the party came to a, a quite a quick end. And as it did, there were all kinds of other consequences. Just let's look at this. This is Chinese trade uh, right up to 2015. Here we have 1993. The top line, these are exports going across there, and the bottom line are all the imports. And you can see the trade balance. So China was, uh, was exporting much more than it was importing. A lot of the stuff uh, that, it was sending, uh, that it was actually importing was actually going straight out. All this stuff here, was, all the grey stuff, was just... 
uh, stuff coming in, being manufactured into other products, going straight out. Uh, but the fact is that you can see that the days of massive export-led growth in China are over and, and may never come back in quite that same way. At the same time, uh, China has chosen to allow its own currency to appreciate, so the dollar has fallen. So our world is adjusting slowly to the new reality of China becoming transformed, not from an emerging economy, but to a developed one. <laughs> Before I reveal this single word which drives the future, I want to tell you a story. I was at a, at a conference recently, and I was a bit late. I was supposed to be on the platform in less than five minutes, and I realized I'd left my pointer in my, in my bedroom. I had to go all the way up to the top. Uh, it was in New York, 3,422 stories high. I needed a lift to go quickly up the top to my room, right at the top, and then came all the way back down again, and I'm standing there. Now, I confess to you, I'm waiting, I'm looking at my watch, I'm getting anxious, I have less than three minutes now. I was tempted to do something totally crazy. I know that you would never, ever do such a thing, but I was tempted for a moment to actually go and press the lift button more than once. Now, I know that you would never, ever do such a thing. Perhaps you would. And put your hands up if you have, I, I know I won't, I won't take offense but, or, or joke at you, but put your hands up if you have done it once in your life. At least you have touched that lift button more than once. Now, I, know, I know even Bill Gates, even Bill Gates cannot make the lift come faster by pressing the button more than once. You know the lift cannot come more quickly, but you still do it. And why is that? It didn't come. I have another confession. I started to talk to it. I said, come on, come on, and put your hands up if you have talked. <laughs> talked to your car. Come on, come on, brrr, come on. Put your hands up if you talk to a machine. I fly a lot. I asked some American airline pilots this question. I had 800 airline pilots from across America. Interesting group. I like my planes to come up, go, come down. I asked them a question. I said, uh, how many of you actually talk to your planes? You know what the answer is? 99.5% of all American pilots talk to their planes. Come on, baby, it's time to go. <laughs> it worried me. <laughs> it also made me think. You see, the most important word that drives the future is not logic, it's not spreadsheets. You see, you're rational people, but you still talk to a lift. The most important thing that drives the future is, of course, of course, it's emotion. The First World War was started as an emotional reaction to a single bullet. The subprime crisis has largely been an emotional reaction by markets to small events, which then got magnified. The European mess is caused by nationalist emotions, tribalism inside countries, that keeps them from working together. Emotion. And as we look at emotion, we find that emotions are changing, they're changing fast, and here we see the key to growth in your company. We see the key to leadership, the key to motivation, uh, the key to transforming your world and making a huge amount of money. Emotions have changed. Why? Because people want more socially aware capitalism following not just the global banking crisis, but the oligarch scandals, the leadership scandals, all the other scandals we had in 2014. And more to come, no doubt. You see, it's all about seeing the world not only through a different pair of glasses in terms of institutional blindness, but in terms of customer blindness. Let me show you what I mean. See, in today's world, we know the survey show that uh, in uh, the survey showed last week, I think it was a Google survey, that if your website takes more than 10 seconds to load, you lose 80% of your sales. Just think about it. 10 seconds, 80% of sales, okay? Now, here's another question. Let's suppose your electricity company has billed you four times for the same thing and uh, is, isn't answering any, any letters or anything, or emails or whatever, so you're on the phone to them, and they say, press one for accounts, press two for customer service, but put your hands up if you find that really annoying. <laughs> put your hands up if you find, make you so mad, you think it's a social crime, and anyone who puts such a system in should be thrown in prison and the key thrown away. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> now. now, next question. A more embarrassing one. 
Put your hands up if your own company uses such a system with your own customers. No, I, I know that it's too embarrassing to confess. But let me tell you, I have asked this question of hundreds of electricity companies, uh, pharma companies, uh, drug companies, I, I mean, technology companies, phone companies, and they all put their hands up. How is this? We know that the quickest way to make our customers really angry with us is to make them press a button. Why? 10 seconds is a long time. 10 seconds is enough to lose 80% of your business, correct? Therefore, two or three seconds on a mobile phone is just life's too short, right? Life's too short to sell things you don't believe in. Life's too short to press someone else's buttons. So what happened was this. When we wear our own pair of glasses as a consumer and we go home and we phone the electricity company, our brain is programmed in one way. When we go back to work the following day and we're looking at the bottom line and planning our own strategic way of saving money, our brain is programmed a different way. And what I'm saying is that many of the greatest business opportunities in 2.16 will be to connect the emotion that we feel as when we are customers, the discoveries we make about the passions that we ourselves have as customers, and to translate them into an un fresh understanding of what our own customers are thinking and feeling. There are huge, huge opportunities here. Now, I want to turn to demographics. Demographics is, the, is an enormous driver of business. People often say to me, where can I go next for, for my next big opportunity? Look at demographics and you have the answer. Demographics tells us that there are 300 million people moving from rural areas into cities in China in the next decade. Demographics tells us 450 million more will move in Africa from rural areas into cities. Demographics tells us why it is that oil prices are where they are. Uh, the copper prices are where they are. Yes, I know markets go up and down, but there are fundamental changes taking place here in our world. Demographics tells us, for instance, that India is a young country, China is an old country. Put up your hands if you've been to India recently. You couldn't help being touched by children, correct? Put your hands up if you've been to China recently. Did you see any children in the park? Maybe one or two. Not many. Demographics tells us that Europe is dying. Demographic tells us that in Norway, as in Germany, today you need around eight great-grandparents to produce a single great-grandchild. That's the simple maths. If you only have on average 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6 children per couple, your population halves in every generation. It's very simple. You need 2.4, 2.5 children per couple to be, remain the same. You see, you either have to, uh, well, what is the solution? In Italy, in, by 2026, in 11 years' time, there will be more than 1 million people over the age of 90. It's a new market. Most of them will be women. A new market providing products and services for women over the age of 90. Actually, enough women to sway every election, to change every election in every parliament in Italy for the next 20 years. Demographics tells us that Asia is also aging, especially China. Uh, by 2050, 65% of all 50-year-olds will be in Asia. Demographics, this is what it means for China. Look at this. Uh, this is uh, the number of people added to the workforce each year. So that was 80, 78 million, 75 million new workers added to the workforce in 1990. But look in 2015. China lost, will lose 40 million workers this year. 40 million. <laughs> Why? Just because the population is getting old. That's what happens if you only produce on average 1.2, 1.3 children per couple or less. So uh, demographics is of fundamental importance. Demographics tells us you, you either have to make babies or you have to import them. There's no other way. <laughs> no. And one thing that changes demographics is aging, or rather how long we're going to live. And here I have some extraordinary news to report from just the last few weeks. Now we knew quite a lot of this in 2010, it was updated in 2012, and it's accelerated just the last three years. But we know now that monkeys on a particular diet 
after 20 years, can be divided into two groups. One group where half of them are dead and the other where only 20% have died. <laughs> Amazing. They've got less cancer, less diabetes, less heart problems. They've got better memory. Uh, it's just the beginning of a, of a new way of tackling the tick-tock of your clock. And uh, we have the ability now, we've had it, uh, the first labs have just been launched, as you know, in Europe uh, in the last six months, uh, to give you a basic screen of your whole genetic code in about one hour. It's not totally accurate, but it enables uh, you to match most of your genes with other people in this room, and maybe with another generation from other parts of the world. So we can then fit your medical records and their medical records and make associations. And we can begin to make predictions, which allows us to treat disease earlier. What about this as a drug? This is a drug that was launched, uh, that was developed in 2003 and works. Uh, it, uh, it restores and maintains the youthful elasticity of hardened arteries. It lowers the blood pressure permanently if you take it for four weeks. At the same time, it gives you a total body lift. Imagine walking down the road, and you're not sure if the woman you have passed is 19 or 90. <laughs> now, I can tell you the drug was developed by Altion, but don't buy the shares because it didn't work then. It only worked in mice and rats. But it was still working, and we've got better. And there are several other companies that have taken that research on, and it looks like we now have a drug that is clinically active, able to reduce blood pressure permanently, and it has all kinds of effects on the skin. Amazing. Now, I hope it doesn't have side effects, but we are entering some new worlds which have huge impact for our future. At the same time, one in three newborn babies born today in, uh, in New York will develop diabetes. Diabetes which comes from being too fat. And they will develop it as a child. They should only develop it as an adult, but it's coming to them soon. So we will need all kinds of new treatments against diabetes, which are coming. At the same time, here is another uh, part of your cell. Every one of your cells has a, has a generator inside it of electricity. This is the generator. It's called a mitochondria. And up to 5, 10, or 15% of all your energy is wasted. And as you get older, 25% is wasted. And we now have a simple molecule, which we can give to mice and rats and monkeys, which means that the energy loss is only 5%. So it is improving memory, uh, the ability to run, uh, the ability to heal, uh, the, uh, the, the liver function, uh, skin uh, texture. The whole body is being re-engineered with the simple medicines, which we had in 2005, 2006, but are now coming onto the market. And then, of course, there's nanotechnology, the ability to make these incredible machines. This is a single human cell. And this machine here, built with nanotech, nanotechnology, is able to feel the outside edge of the cell, and it can detect if this is a red cell, or a skin cell, or a brain cell, and it will only connect with the cell it's programmed to connect to. And the moment it does, it injects with its own needle here a special package of instructions, which goes into the cell, it hijacks the brain of the cell, and turns the cell into a virus. I said what it is. It's a virus. And we've been building viruses for a very long time. Viruses are simply nanotech robots. Viruses do not live, they do not breathe, they only reproduce by hijacking the brains of other cells. We are in an extraordinary new season of medical technology, which will be beyond anything that we could ever have imagined back in 2010. We have the ability already to rebuild the brain and the spinal cord and the heart using your own cells. These are cells taken from your skin, uh, from your mouth, from your liver, from your bones. And we are able to regrow heart, heart tissue, brain tissue from these. The first clinical trials have just been completed. You probably read about it this week. The first people have just... Uh, the first trial has just been completed to allow people to start to see again when they have lost their sight. And their sight is being restored using their own cells taken from their nose. Extraordinary. We are on the edge of something quite amazing. And, and the final piece just announced this week. 
You may have been following the Rockfish Project, which is now 15 years old. The Rockfish Project studies two kinds of rockfish. Here in Alicent, we have huge interest in fishing of all kinds, and also we see a lot of whales off the coast. The Rockfish Project has found two kinds of fish that are identical, but some die in 10 years, the others die in 100 years. These whales, some of these whales die in 20 years, others in 200 years. They drink the same water. They live in the same sea. They eat the same food. The only difference we can find is in their genetic code. They have found a secret of non-aging. We cannot find any way they get old. There is no aging process in any of their cells. They seem to have the same trick as parrots, as turtles, and, uh, and some other creatures. This week, scientists have announced that they have now described the differences in these genes. And they have found the same genes in the rockfish and the whale and the turtle and the parrot and similar genes in human beings that live for more than 100 years. We are on the edge of something quite extraordinary. Uh, I'm just telling you history. You tell me the future. Now, we hear a lot about convergence. Convergence was the big word in 210, but I was never terribly excited about it. I actually thought that divergence was more important. You see, yes, we can say that all devices tend to look the same, and we can put all kinds of features into these things. They get smaller or they get larger. Uh, we can stitch them into human brain tissue and the rest. Uh, by the way, put your hands up if you would like a chip inside your head. You see, the future is not about innovation. We can do these things. The question is whether you want them. The future is about emotion. Emotion tells us which innovations succeed or not. But I want to suggest to you that innovation is that all convergence is really boring. That's why most cars look the same. They all have air conditioning, and uh, these days, uh, most of them now have automatic uh, uh, ability to join tr uh, car trains. They uh, can connect together. Uh, you can go to sleep in the motorway, and they will drive for you. It's convergence. They all have the same air conditioning, and uh, central locking, and satellite navigation, and voice recognition, and that's convergence. Convergence means everything the same, and we just compete on price. And if you like to do that, that's great, but it's a terrible place for a business. Most successful business wants to be divergent, to do things very differently, to serve customers better, to constantly stretch uh, ways to get away from where everyone else is. And can I tell you one other very dangerous kind of convergence, which is called benchmarking. Benchmarking was very popular in 2010, but was completely disgraced in two t in, in, by 212, and is history. Benchmarking simply means that we look at what all the others are doing, and if they are doing the same risks, so do we. And that's what produced the subprime crisis. Benchmarking is simply converging on risk and other behaviors. But if we want to be safe, and we want to innovate, we will always try and be different from everyone else. That's where our competitive advantage will come from. But we, and here's two uh, silly examples of convergence. I mean, put your hands up if you own one of these. This is a, this is a, a touch-sensitive internet screen on the door of a fridge. Put your hands up if you'd like one. I mean, I can think of all kinds of places to serve the internet, but not the door of your fridge. Uh, here's another one. Intel produced a surfboard where you can surf and do your email at the same time. <laughs> it's great. It's what convergence is all about. See, most of us have these things rather than one of these. Put your hands up if you have a single remote that controls all the devices in your living room. About 2%. Put your hands up if you don't, because you are in love with these ones. <laughs> you see, emotion. Emotion tells us the future. When we understand why you are in love with the old remotes, then we can sell you some more of them. So all true innovation is divergent, and I want to look now at mobile and mobile payments, mobile banking, where that's going to go. Back in 2009-10, this was already happening. We saw this dramatic jump from 2008 to 2012 of PayPal payments, but just look at this. It wasn't just PayPal, it was also M-Pesa in places like Kenya. These are people who are on low incomes, maybe only $5 a day, and yet they are shifting this year $22 billion of payments just using a mobile phone. No banks at all. 
just moving it uh, from mother to father, from son uh, to cousin or whatever. This year, you in Norway and in other parts of the world will move 400 million mobile payments on devices worth 320 billion. This is today, where is it going tomorrow? I want to talk about the new Vermoosel partnership, the next generation of where this is going to go. It was first announced in 2012. I wanted to look at what's happened just in the last few weeks and where I think it's going. The UK card market alone was worth 800 billion a year uh, just in 2012. And 2015, rather, this year, it would be worth that if you include mobile payments as well. Credit card debt of around 85 billion and commissions on all of that is about 16 billion. Now, what's very interesting is when you look at something to do with Moore's Law, because here we have the cost of providing a mobile phone, uh, let's say satellite, um, uh, TV, uh, movies to download, uh, video calls, SMS, voice messages, at the cost of providing um, a replacement uh, iPad or iPhones or whatever the devices you want to use these days uh, every year, all of that we can give you for free. Why? Because the cost of it all is falling towards zero and will continue to do so. And at the same time, the, the amount of value we can capture in financial transactions is going through the roof. With the latest mobile devices, we have biometrics, which means, as you know, I can put my thumb on my phone. It knows exactly who I am. The new EU rules allow me to transact up to 100,000 euros with a single thumbprint on my mobile and pressing a three-digit pin. That's enough to buy a boat or a, maybe a half, of a, half of an apartment uh, or, or whatever. 100,000 euros per single transaction using a mobile device and, of course, all the transaction held not by a bank, but by the mobile phone company. And when the mobile phone company is capturing that level of transactions, it's then able to do the deal. And some of you have probably been offered it already, no doubt. And you know the deal, because you've seen it on the advertised everywhere, which is, throw your cards away. That's the slogan, throw your cards away. You keep one, only one card, and you're only 500 euros a month. It's just for emergencies, just in case the phone is broken and everything else goes on the phone. And if you agree to that, you get every tech piece of technology you want for free. You get as many mobile phones as you want for free. You get a free computer for your children for free. You get a, um, a unlimited videos for free. Why? Because the cost of doing it is so much less than the amount of money we make from handling all of your finances. So, it's telco banking. It's the end of banking. It's the end of telcos. It's the end of contracts. It's the end of selling a mobile phone system. It's the end of selling portable computers. It's the end of selling smart pads. Why? Because it all comes for free. It just depends on who's handling your finances. It's a different way of working. Now, back in 2010, 2012, I was interviewing bankers and I was at big conferences like this. I was asking bankers and telcos to put up their hands if they thought that this was likely to happen. Every single one, just about, would put up their hands. The only debate was about the date. You see, most debates about the future are not actually debates about big uncertainties. They're debates about timing. It's simply a question of when. And it looks like pretty soon. Now, why did Google search have to change? Well, you know the answer to that, of course, because Google search and other searches were getting corrupted by all kinds of robots. That was 2005, 6, 7. And from 2009 to 2013, the search indexes were overwhelmed by hundreds of thousands of people in India and Asia who were employed on very low wages to basically spoof the search engines, to create traffic, to create real human links, to post all kinds of stuff that helped the search engines to think that the sites were really popular. So that's why Google and Facebook and others made a declaration in 2011 that only real people would be allowed to play the game. From that point on, if you want to open a Facebook account, you have to prove who you are. We actually want, really, your national insurance number. That started in 2013. We want every digital identity to be known. Why? For the sake of humankind. Not only to track, to track criminals, but also to stop the spammers. And it meant that from that point on, uh, what's your name, sir? Simon. Simon. It meant that Simon, Simon's networks could then be completely mapped out. Some ways known about by Simon, some ways not. Uh, but because of all kinds of electronic trails that you leave, 
uh, whether it's the friends you have on Facebook, it's colleagues who mention your name in work, uh, it's email traces that go through Gmail or whatever it is. And we start to map out every single human being on the face of this earth and their connections with every other human being that we can find on the face of this earth and start to validate the kind of conversations that are going on so we can begin to understand what will be relevant to Simon's life. Now, Simon can opt out of all of that, and maybe you have. But of course, as you know, the moment you do that, you miss 30% of all the financial offers. You're completely out of the, of the uh, telco banking system that I've just mentioned, so you're actually almost with, you're left with pieces of plastic to trade with if you want. And actually, there's very little choice. You're either in it or you're not. And it's been fascinating to see how the social networks have grown. And of course, the spammers have hit back. Creating virtual villages of non-existent people. There are at least, we think, 300 million people, uh, electronic people, who don't exist. They live in villages. They have relationships. They go to parties. They have conversations and blogs. It's entirely computer-driven and human-driven, these fictitious people. The average human being is able to run over five or 600 fictitious individuals uh, in some of these networks, and the attempt is to try and hit back. See, it's all about trust, and that's why it's the end of marketing, the end of traditional marketing. Look at this. You've got three options. This is an old TripAdvisor screen from 212. Uh, just type in the name of a hotel, see what happens. You get three results. One, two, three. The first says, the most delightful hotel in the world. Fantastic. Second says, terrible place, dirty, noisy, I nearly died of food poisoning. And on the right, you have the official ad. Pay ad with Google. And you have one click, which do you go on first? You've just been booked in to stay at this hotel in Oslo, which do you click on first? One click, think about it. Put your hands up if you go first for the honeymoon suite, the wonderful story. Put your hands up if you go first for the story about the rats, food poisoning, and the insects in the bedrooms. Put your hands up if you go first to the official website, because you know that's the only thing that tells you the truth. See, what you've shown me, one or two have gone for the either side, but most of you have gone for this one. Why is that? Because marketing is dead, you've shown me that. In Norway, in May 2015, marketing is dead. Traditional marketing is dead. And the more you advertise this hotel, the worse it gets. The more you advertise on the radio, TV, or national press, the more people type the name of the hotel into Google, and the more people get exposed to seeing this at the top of the listings. So what we're learning, therefore, is that it's all about trust, it's about relationship, it's about recommendation. And actually, we need a new word for marketing. I haven't got it yet, but I think we'll see one begin to emerge in the next year or two. It's about information, revelation, and recommendation. That's the future. Anything else is just hype, spin, and a waste of space. Because life's too short to sell things you don't believe in, correct? And how can you prove that you believe in it? Because everyone's raving about it. It's the recommendation that gives you the authority and permission to market, and anything else is just hype and spin. Just want to look finally at the, at the future TV. In 2012, already, 33% in the UK had stopped watching live TV. It was finished. Now, 95% of all EU bandwidth is video. Everything else is just rubbish in comparison. Emails, it's nothing. Because you can back up 300 million emails in the same space as a two-hour video. So emails are irrelevant, voice is irrelevant, SMS is irrelevant to telcos, only video matters. Video is what's driving just about all of this. Uh, some mobile users in France are using more than 30 gigabytes per week on their mobile phones. Um, and uh, it's just the beginning. And what it, the implications for us, if we're trying to have a conversation with people, is uh, once again, emotion, because here are some people, they are uh, conducting their normal lives, but they have multiple devices on them. Uh, they, when they're watching TV, they're actually also watching a video, they're playing a game, they're doing the mail, they're just about everything else. And the, the issue is, what is that person feeling like now? What is your consumer thinking about now? How can we get inside their space? Do we know who else is with them? Uh, do we know where they are? Are they at home or at work? Are they traveling? Are they in the car? What kind of messages would they be open to right now? And Coca-Cola has done this very well. Coca-Cola can listen to where its users are. Uh, anyone who's downloaded the latest app on their Coca-Cola, this happened in 2012, uh, is being talked to by Coca-Cola as they walk around, as they go close to a machine. They're offered a customized drink, their usual drink. As they walk towards the machine, it drops down. It's paid for on the mobile phone, and it's a unique flavor that only they know about. 
Now, that is, uh, well, I just say that most marketeers in 212 were still stuck in a premillennial model of marketing. They were still thinking about multi-channel marketing. This isn't multi-channel marketing. This is one customer marketing. This is marketing to people who, where you lose 80% of your traffic in 10 seconds. And actually, uh, even in 212, uh, a single poor experience for a mobile phone user with a brand would be enough to kill their entire relationship with the brand forever. A single poor experience. So it's all about emotion, it's not just about the service. And finally, I just want to come to this. I think there's no doubt, you know, there's been a great debate about sustainability and what it actually means. And I guess our whole world went on holiday on the issue during 2010 to about 2013, 2014. And, and yet, there have been some very powerful forces which have continued to, to push us in the direction of sustainability. If you look here at the, uh, at the graph, you'll see how high carbon dioxide has gone. We don't know what that actually means, but here, at this point, there was half a kilogram of ice over our heads, right here in Alassane. We don't know what that means to be there. And we can have a great debate about the science, but the science is simply a best guess at what life will be like when you and I have long since died. <laughs> but if you want to know the future, we need to know the future of passion, and the passions linked to these issues have got stronger and stronger. And the most important thing is the barrel oil price. The fact that we now have oil prices that have been above $100 a barrel for five years has driven more innovation in this area than any amount of green activism and will continue to do so. And fracking, yes, it brought down the energy prices for gas, which has been helpful because it replaced gas-fired power stations. And we've seen all kinds of other innovations. China's gone ahead with nuclear. We're converting gas tires into rubber in a few seconds. We can convert carbon from from, uh, from, from waste, from uh, carbon generating power stations into tomatoes, that's been done, and so on. There are all kinds of innovations happening at the most astonishing speed. We're able to power Russia from the Sahara Desert using uh, the latest technologies which are now being rolled out with the new supergrid that we will see in the next few years. We will see half of all, of all power in the European Union developed from wind quite soon. We will see underground storage uh, of, of high-pressure of, of, uh, of high gas systems in Germany that are large enough to power the whole of Germany for more than a week. But still, there are moral issues here. 35% of all US grain is burnt in cars. Does it matter? Yes, it does, because it's affecting food prices. So in conclusion, and this is my final slide, our challenge is to build a better world. Life's too short to sell things we don't believe in. Every day matters, every day counts. And as we connect with the passions that people have, as we understand the emotions that they have, as we understand what it is that drives them, what matters to them, what matters to us, then we will find ways to make markets, ways to sell products, ways to improve their world and improve our business. I wish you every success. Thank you very much.